All right, so anyway, so I started at this newspaper. Here's a few pictures I took when I was at this little newspaper. And eventually, and I would just walk around the neighborhood, you know, when you're young, even though I was so shy, and I always liked to listen and, and, and meet people. And there's nothing like hiding behind this machine, this camera. So I walked into this other little newspaper. It was an African-American uh, publication back in the day when they had things like that, when there's real true segregation in Florida. And this man had sat at this desk for 50 years, and the linoleum just wore away underneath his feet. And this was one of my first assignments, was the Boy Scout Jamboree. But, uh, all this was on tri of course. I fancied myself a sports photographer, but for some reason, the Times keeps sending Doug Mills to the Olympics. I, I don't know. That's not a bad picture when you think about it, but uh, any questions? So I would walk around, and there were still you know, remnants of of you know, a segregated pass round. I found this guy and he, sh he said, oh, I want to show you something. And it just happened to be the day before Martin Luther King's birthday, so. This was a school assignment. I went to school at Daytona Beach Community College. And uh, uh, there you go, Cassie and any other. And, and again, I, I, we grew up very poor. My, my grandfather was a Franciscan priest and we inherited his vow of poverty, so going to a university was just out of the question. But, so, but Daytona Beach had an absolutely sensational program, but it was fashion and commercial photography and the like, so. But I just like, really liked going around doing, doing stories, and uh, I, I learned a lot about storytelling. But, but when I got out of school, my portfolio just didn't, couldn't compete with the OU in Indiana, Missouri, Kentucky, and so I started as a lab tech at the Palm Beach Post Times. And, I always had this interest in politics. Both my, my brothers and I always were arguing politics because what else can you do when the coach is sitting you on the bench the whole game you're not playing? So, uh, so I, I finally got to go as a lab tech to shoot to meet the the final edition of the Palm Beach Times. It went out to like 500 people or something like that. But it was going to be my first. Put your broom now. Go out and shoot. This is my first front page picture in politics of the Palm Beach Times. I remember waiting in my lab apron for the, it to come out. And so I thought, boy, Andrew Richards will finally go out with me and, you know, my civics teacher, wait till he sees this. And of course, then it was photo by Stanley Crowley. So, but, <laughs> it's all right. I, you know, my answer to my brother's name, Pat, most of two, so, but, uh, but at any rate. So more stuff from the Palm Beach Post and uh, my walking around trying to make art, making something out of anything. Questions? Okay, here's a little something at the airport there, the Klan walking, but you can retire in Florida and hold a rally. So, uh, this is uh, Haitian immigrants that came in illegally. It's always a current issue. Here's, in, the, in the early 1980s, we had one of the worst recessions in this country, and there were people living in tents. Uh, the, uh, the, most of the, uh, the middle of America, uh, you know, Michigan, Illinois, lot, they're really suffering. This is when there was the downturn in a lot of industry. So people were coming to Florida and uh, living in campgrounds and then I found this woman with this television on it. Then there was a dog living with an air-conditioned dog house. So here another. Anyway, this was the type of stuff. There was a big Jesus movement. These were the Jesus people walking around. I caught them at the bail bonds agency. I did this series of uh, prizes you win at the fair. So, and I did little interviews with these people. And uh, a little fender bender, and all of a sudden I hear this little buzz, and I see this little kid roll up to help out. It was pure serendipity. So, And before the iPhone, so, okay. A track. And making your own fun here. So the Washington DC plate there too, smoking clowns. So you have things of different, everybody's so upset about smoking, even clowns smoked back then, so. Okay, little thing. Anyway, this was the type of stuff I used to do down in Florida before I finally got to Washington DC, Captain Dynamite. I just want you to know he survived this, so you're all a little rattled. Any questions on this? Yes. 
Yeah, so it took me a year to get on the street. And what I would do, I'd go in every day. Look, I just didn't have the portfolio for it. So I was working 2 to 11, and I'd show up at 8 every morning, and I'd look at the board. If the photographers wouldn't let me go out with them, I went out on my own. And I always had a story. I was always working on a story. And uh, the Palm Beach Post had terrific photographers there. Uh, uh, Dana Smith and Scott Applewhite, George Wedding. It was just some really terrific uh, storytellers. So I learned... Uh, how to make a story almost out of anything. So, but it took me a year before I got on the street. So, and then I don't get asked to do this much. This is why I, I'm not a very good speaker, and I'd rather take questions. But, so, but Dave Burnett had to cancel at the last minute. They brought me, and this is 2009. I just, you know, our own Melissa Lytle right there at 11 a.m. and. And uh, so I would get to join this distinguished group of speakers, but you know, but then anyway, I didn't take it personal. Was, it's more than four o'clock slot. I mean, what am I? But anyway, so if I were your king, so uh, I moved to Florida. I always wanted to cover politics, and I got a little bits of it when I was in Florida, and uh, moved to Washington in 1986. And uh, this was obviously no parking. This was Bill Clinton's limo parked outside of a school, I stopped and made this, because uh, this is how they all feel about themselves. This is my first political shot, and this is Richard Nixon in 1974 during Watergate with my little Nike or Matt camera and Tri-X, and uh, Ronald Reagan in 1980. And then uh, Chappaquiddick, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they, it's, they, uh, Chappaquiddick, uh, they opened up a, headquarters in a driving school. So these signs all disappeared the next day. They were really upset with that. Young George Bush running for president. Okay, and then we're back up to about 2000 with, uh, anyway, so you know, every day you're out on the trail and it's pretty much the same thing. So you're, I'm always trying to look around the margins for something different. This was, again, just serendipity. And I had this rare day when I had a, a, a pin to get behind the scenes. And you don't get that often, but, and he was getting ready to go out to make a speech, and this was an air conditioning unit, and he stuck his arms in it. And uh, I snapped, and the guy on the left walked over me, and he says, you're not gonna use that, are you? So, but anyway. <laughs> and then, this was in an Iowa diner, interrupting. And one time we were coming on the plane, and he was serving drinks for everybody, so that was really nice. Any questions? <laughs> okay. I, did it run? I, you know, we're going to have to ask. A couple of my editors are here. Let's corner them later on. So, you know, there's a lot here. You know, like, for instance, does it run? I mean, if you're on my Instagram account, incidentally, every time I get another follower on Instagram, the angel turns one of my hairs henna color. So please, it's at Crowley Grass. Okay, so this was this was actually Bob Dole. Uh, this uh, and when I moved this, they wouldn't run it at first. They, you know, he was because his age was a huge issue. They eventually did, but and I agreed with them on that. It was a funny picture, but but uh, but they did eventually run it. Okay, and then Joe Mo. So this is my spiritual segment here. So uh, you know this because and then this one here. This was also in Florida. So, any questions? Uh, yes, question there. Well, I mean, we grew up, again, we were very poor, so uh, we had to make our own fun and our own amusements. And my brothers and I, when we weren't fighting each other, you know, we were constantly creating, so. Um, so we just, and you know, it's, uh, so we always had a strong sense of humor. So I always like to look for something, but I also want to say something. You know, this was a photo op of, uh, John Kerry was introducing his new running mate, the family man, John Edwards there. And they had, a, it said, they had us behind haystacks and they said, you know, you can't move, you can't shoot the Heinz mansion. We're gonna come down and we're gonna make this announcement. And you look up at the top of the hill, and here's this row of Edwards and Carey family members, and it, and it looked like an allergy commercial. They're all coming down in slow motion and chasing the kids, and this is what they wanted, this Kennedy-esque scene. 
So they get out there in that lineup, and just for one split second, Teresa Hines reaches over and tries to remove Jack Edwards' thumb from his mouth. And, you know, you just don't do that to another kid, that, you know, kid that's not yours. Anyway, that ran on the front page, and they were furious. And I can't repeat the language they used on the last day of the campaign explaining why I never got access after that, but they, they didn't forgive me for this picture. But this is one of my favorites. I did a whole series. Again, I, I, what angers and offends me about politicians is that, you know, they're driven from one, you know, from the airport to the event, and they never have to stop and get their hands dirty. They go in and it's a hand-picked audience of syncophants and that. And so I was trying to, exp to document what, you, what they see along the road, or at least glance at. So this was part of a series. And my rule of, is I have to shoot it from the bus. I called it off the bus, and I did a whole series of diptychs, and there's 12 of them. But, but Zach convinced me to cut most of those out. So, OK. How do I do this? OK. And this was when I, at the last minute, I slid down in between these two stages, right past the Secret Service, and then he turned around and looked at me. It seemed like a big deal back in the day. Anyway, so this was after a rally while they kept us waiting. And it's, you know, Kerry was having a rough, his numbers were down, so I went, I shot off the bus, and I made this collection of trampled pictures. And because uh, I, I try to tell these handlers, idle hands are the workshop of the devil. You don't want to give me access, I'll find something to do. Now this one, just real quick, this is not a great picture. He was, had stopped for an interview at the New York Times in West Palm Beach, Florida, coincidentally. And so I needed to make a picture for the print edition because we all know TV's a fad. Mike Kepka will agree with me on that. So, and he does this interview, was on the economy. And this guy knows very little about the economy. So I made this shot. And, and left, and I waited, and they said, we're going over to this rally afterwards, go, go sit in the van. It was just your typical four-seater van, and uh, we'll give you a ride over. And so he had met with donors right before this interview. He gets into the van, and there's this two, I'm in the back, there's two donors in the front, and then he gets in one, the, the third seat up, and then right up here is his press handle. He turns around, he starts, cursing and swearing about the liberal New York Times and who set up this article. And he's on the phone and he's chewing somebody out and he's turning around to this couple right in front of me saying, oh, that the liberals of the New York Times, that'd be good. Bye -bye. And I'm just looking, I've been on this guy's bus for months and he has no clue I'm with the New York Times. <laughs> but his press secretary did. She was looking at me with pleading eyes, hoping I wouldn't say anything. But at any rate, he lost that race. But uh, this was... <laughs> This is, you know, this. Uh, there's always a couple of hotheads. Here's, this is uh, hotheads at a I moved a series of hecklers, hecklers of, in history. This was one of them, but uh, Zach convinced me not to run them all. So, again, trying to make some. They really didn't like each other. Uh, this was from. I love this. Bibles and guns. And she was selling aprons that had a holster built into it. Any questions? I don't have her address. You're going to have to look it up online. Etsy. This is I love this. These labor leaders with their rough hands. You know, this is at a rally, and the little girl behind. But, okay. And this was like the worst job as an intern on a campaign, right? <laughs> he lost too, but, and they lost their dignity. Okay, so this was. You know, sometimes you just, this was on stage in Iowa, and they brought up Katy Perry. She's a, a vocalist, popular vocalist, and. Uh, Anyway, so I liked the wave. I kept waiting for the wings and the, the and I don't know if they ran. When I was in a hotel room, and I just set my camera up on the irony board. It's this constant stream of a little bit of lousy television. You can see these game shows or whatever, and then a political ad, and it was just hammer and tong against each other, uh, Romney against Obama. It's hard to read, but Politico picked this up and ran it in their magazine. So, uh, so it was uh, just yet another way. I, I like to, when you have so little information, or rather a picture, I, I don't make a whole lot of, I mean, not every picture is a decisive moment. But, so that's why I do a lot of multiples, uh, because I think a visual piece of information, it, it, we need to convey that. And if you can put it together with a few other pictures or, or another picture and create this, you know, this uh, dynamic phrase, a well-turned phrase, then why not? Anybody want to argue with me about that? Editors? Editors? Okay. My, because we all have to shoot down. Yeah, and, and just lastly, uh, so this is, you know, for, 
they all want this job so badly. This is, uh, I was on the parade truck in the inaugural parade, and this was never reported, but all along the line you had, Pennsylvania Avenue had these cops in riot gear holding back these people just absolutely filled with hate for George Bush, and they were throwing eggs at his limo. And uh, compared to uh, the uh, Obama inauguration where, and I, I, this represents the bubble you put yourself in. He's behind a, a uh, bulletproof glass and there's the NASA engineer in his bubble. And the, the funny thing about this is that the parade ran so late that all his guests left to go to the balls. That's why it's all empty and they had to stay for the whole thing, so. Any questions before we move on to the next thing? All right, smoke-filled rooms. This was a hundred page serial novella that ran on the lens. It never got out of lens, never got into the politics section, so my, my own mother didn't see it, but. Um, so uh, we ran it in nine parts. It had a cover and an index and the whole nine yards. And as I presented each part, I, I, I wasn't always sure what the next chapter was gonna be. My idea was is that this would play on an iPad or an iPhone and that we could produce books easily if you go to the Olympics or the Super Bowl or, or uh, Mike Kepka's story in Africa. Um, we can produce these books and these novels it's, and have you know, printing on demand, buy the prints and that. So um, I did these designs myself, which is why I think they never left lens. They really disliked it. Michelle really didn't like the little circles. It drove her nuts. But I really wanted people to stop and blow it up and look at it, force them not just to flip through, but really spend some time. And uh, having grown up on Superman and Batman comic books, I liked the, the graphic novella approach and embedding the, the text there. Um, so we're skipping this was another part there and so if and so the the information the caption is what's Im important so that if you go back and read this you can't believe how things have changed in just four years in this campaign um, so anyway so this is just a few samples of layout I found this drinking Lincoln and I well, thank God I figured out a, a way to use that but and I, this was part of a whole series, it was an Obama trip, and again, it's that bubble, you're in this bubble, you never have to interact with these people, you know, you're, it's always clean, you know. It's like living in Washington, we don't feel people's pain out there. You know, we, you know, thank God for the Carol Guzies and the Gilkeys and the Jessica Rinaldis that are going out and doing these stories and forcing these politicians to, uh, to see the issues that we face across America because we're so insulated here. Anyway, any questions about this before I plow through it? Any disagreements, agreements? Okay. Yes? Okay. Oh, slower on the pictures or am I talking? Oh, okay, so. Uh, I don't even know why. Okay, so I, I first did this. I really like this lay, working with layout and design in my pictures. This was all shot on two and a quarter of a, uh, it was mountaintop removal uh, and in, in White City, West Virginia, and on the border of Kentucky. So um, again, we, uh, I just, it didn't run either, I don't think, but. Too fast, too slow? Okay. So at any rate, like I said, I got here in 1986, and by 1998, my name was picked, uh, they chose my name out of a hat, and that's my colleague Doug Mills, up on third from the right there. And that's Ronald Reagan, Dirk Halstead, Larry Downing, and uh, Dana Smith, and uh, I, I couldn't believe it. They literally picked my name out of a hat, and I was part of this pool, and uh, I was young, and I was excited, and then, Dirk Halstead sent pictures to the president, he signed them, and I had this to hang on my wall, but of course he spelled my name. <laughs> but, uh, I don't, so at least it wasn't Stanley, so. Uh, all right, so, I mean, again, going back to uh, my perspective now from, we, we picked up the White House. What happened when the magazines all disappeared eight years ago? They held a seat on the tight pool position in the Air Force One position for, for decades, and the New York Times have been trying to get on it since before flight. 
And uh, so once they abandoned it, we jumped in and took that seat. But it's, it's me, Doug, and the interns that try to handle all these assignments. So I do a lot of work with, for the last eight years, a lot of work at the White House. And so trying to make something out of nothing on Air Force One of these, I, I've just about run out of gimmicks. And I'm just saying just about, because I just can't admit to myself that I've absolutely run out of ideas. But anyway, a couple of views getting on and off. And this was that shot I made, uh, that's where Stephen Crowley made of, of Reagan behind his desk. So. And, but the issues they face, again, for Ronald Reagan was when the AIDS epidemic really exploded and this little boy who's on a cocktail of drugs and then the uh, silence or death demonstrations that were and the constant all around Washington. But it was, the, it, was, it was photojournalists that were really bringing these stories to forcing Washington to pay attention to them. And, and, um, and so each president creates, has their own crisis. And of course, Clinton created his own crisis with, crisis with the Monica Lewinsky uh, affair. So they wouldn't let us in when he was making this. This was him admitting to the country that he made a mistake. And uh, he was apologizing. And they wouldn't let us in to take a picture. But I saw the monitors there. And I made this. And he was saying, does my hair look OK? He was live, so I made that shot, and it's my favorite uh, from the Clinton years. And and this was outside a demonstration. Uh, he was going to an event, and and this was him coming out to the uh, to the Rose Garden after the the courts decided not to. After he was impeached in the Senate, any questions? And then of course, 9/11, and um, when suddenly. There was less to laugh about. This was over in Afghanistan in November, November of 2001. This was a midnight flight. This is one of my favorite pictures of the President Obama. This was on a midnight flight. I, Susanna Robb, my, my uh, partner, was having an opening of a show, and her parents were coming in, and I was going to be there as arm candy, because, you know. I, and, uh, and I found out about this trip. We, I wasn't, we weren't allowed to say anything. No one in, in New York knew. No one in the Bureau knew. There was just the people that were going on this midnight trip to, to Afghanistan. And so I just looked at Susanna and said, I'm not going to be able to make it Saturday night. And, you know, 72 hours later, there we were landing in the, in the evening in Kabul. And the pres it was so dirty and dusty that they had these flat black Black Hawk Helicopters, and you can see the president has this X, dirt of X, this X dirt from the dust that was flying in from his suitcase. It's much clearer on my picture, but much clearer on that side than that side. That's for a damn sure. But right, any questions? So again, dealing with the Middle East, your Palestinian boy who's been shot, and um, Netanyahu meeting with President Obama. Uh, this this uh, strained relationship with uh, Vladimir Putin. I just think that this was a photo op that just fell apart, and the Times ran this on the front page, which I was, thought was really important, that we got beyond the, the phoniness of the moment. This was like one of these, uh, the, uh, the, when the president of Saudi, uh, I'm sorry, the king of Saudi Arabia passed away, and the president was in India, instead made a side trip over there to pay his respects, and this was the first time I really sensed what power was all about, this moment, this trip, the people that came, again, to pay their respects. Um, and I thought, they thought this picture really conveyed it. This was the trip. Uh, he was at a parade when he had a, in India. This is one of my favorite pictures last year, the president and Pope Francis during an arrival ceremony. Any questions? Thank you very much. Who said that? Fine. Thank you. And this is one, of course, didn't run, but they, it was the uh, lineup to greet the president in Bavaria. And they were all turned around the wrong way. And if you look in the second panel, you, you can see the president's just walking behind them. And then they, they turn around again, too. So anyway, they all turn around the wrong way again. And then they turn back away. So, and this is another one of my favorites. I, I, I walked in. I wanted the president was going to have his first press conference in the East Room. And I knew he'd walk by this. 
and he always likes to, he strikes the Lincoln pose, he's got the Lincoln mole and all that. This would be a great shot of him walking by this statue, and I asked for permission to do it, and they said, we'll work on that, and they're all new. Was, and as I walked out, I was bounding out because I figured I was going to get it. I walked down the street, and it was just pure coincidence, this guy on the right just handing out pamphlets in front of a presidential memorabilia picture. So I don't know if this ever ran. Tanner, are you here? And this is what you wind up with as a library in the end. So here's five presidents there. And, but uh, I, this is another one of my favorites. I was at the Democratic National Committee, and, and when you walk in, it was for a press conference. And when you walk in, I was walking around, and there is you know, giant portraits of you know, Franklin Roosevelt and uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Then you look in the coat closet, and here's poor Adlai Stevenson, because he lost. <laughs> And they ran this in, in the Week in Review. So over there, why am I doing this? Okay, so again, any questions? Oh, Al Drago. He's finally not working today. That's very impressive, thank you. Um, any questions or anything? All right, so uh, this is from, again, looking at the issues. And I've done very little of this stuff compared to, again, you'll see her, Carol Guzzi. She's amazing, and uh, some other great sh speakers here. But this was during the... In Africa, we spent about six weeks there um, doing, working on a big series. This was after, right after the Rwanda massacre. And we were riding down the road. This is really early primitive digital, so the color is a little weird, but it actually has an interesting patina. And this poor little child on the left, her mother had given birth to this baby. They were on the roadside, and this little girl was running around, covering her mother up and waving off flies and that. And you, it's. You know, you're absolutely helpless to do anything. And they were outside of a village, but they were, because of uh, because they were Hutu, the village wouldn't help them. So uh, this was in, Af in Afghanistan, again on the it's in Kosovo. Again, it's all about the people, or the women, the children because of war, They're, these are the refugees, Afghan refugees, Kosovo, Serbian Kosovo refugees. When I was in Afghanistan, uh, when I first, it took us about three weeks to finally cross the border from Pakistan into Jalalabad. It turns out that was the day, that was where bin Laden was, in, the day we got there, the evening we got there was the day bin Laden left Jalalabad and went up into the mountains, into Tora Bora. So we were here for about a month. And I, when I went in, I saw these five street cameras on a rooftop. I thought, well, I'd really like to take, rent one of those and take pictures. And they were only used to do ID pictures. So I rented this camera, and it's sheets of paper. You rip it up into four, and you make a negative. And it has, and I love the, mis the flaws and all that. And you look inside the camera, and you process the picture in developer, and then you throw it into into uh, the fixer right there, so from developer to fixer. So I would have these negatives. I went back and I pasted them up on the window and reversed them in Photoshop and shipped them to New York. And they ran nine of these with really dramatic quotes. I mean, everybody had these incredible stories. But the Taliban has just left literally that, that week. And everybody wanted to come out and talk about you know, what they had hoped for for the future of Afghanistan. So the imperfection of the camera is 150-year-old technology mixed, of course, with digital. So, but I thought, you know, shooting these on digital and color, this really conveyed how Afghanistan, how backwards and medieval it was in some ways. So I thought this was a much more effective way to tell the story of Jalalabad, the people of Jalalabad. Any questions? Okay. And then, of course, you know, when you come back as a, uh, I don't even have to tell you, the, you know, it's, you wait your whole life to be printed up in a magazine, you know, as a swashbuckling, well, anyway. So then just, we'll just go through, I, when, I'm, when I'm not working on politics, I try to work on feature stuff. I've done a series on the Washington Monument, which has always fascinated me. And uh, this is called History Repeating Itself. And... Um, this is called Eyes Waiting. Again, Independence Day. And then uh, this was at the White House. It was an Easter egg roll. And then, so, it's very a lot of security in Washington. So anyway, okay. All right. 
every woman loves a man in uniform. And this, you know, these faces you see everywhere. I, I, when I was a, a child, we lived, in a, we lived in a basement apartment in Jersey City. What gave me this hard edge again was that we were all in the same bedroom. And I, it was me, my two brothers, my mother and father, and my sister. And I would have these nightmares at night. I would always hear it would be a robot walking across the sky. And every time it put his foot down, it would go, Caw. And I, I just so clearly remember this nightmare. I stopped having those nightmares when I looked, when I woke up and I realized it was my father snoring. So this was a tribute to my father. So. And then my, I did a series of embedded in asphalt, which is you know looking for little things. The rule is it has to be embedded, rolled over part of the asphalt, and I have to. The other second rule is to get in and out of the street before I get run over, and I shoot it on film. So this is called Five After Seven. fork in the road, but I'm so embarrassed I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> but, uh, and comb bones, and uh, this is Ace of Spades. I didn't even have to tell you that. You saw that. And uh, a simple way to explain the beginning of life. You have to really study this, but it makes sense. But you know, the Six pack the night before, the morning after with the, yeah, okay. And I signed this one myself, signed edition, so it's in my hand. It's a joke. And I like, again, putting things together. This was a tour of the, the Capitol Rotunda before they tore it apart last year. This one, I was up on the roof. I just saw this kid. This is you know, a working man, you know, babysitting. It's, anyway. Just walking by, booze. Everybody likes to take a selfie. The tourists is at the Capitol. Riding by my bicycle there. If you think it's art, it's art. So, okay. And around the Capitol, just a few. Anyway, so uh, th that's all I have, uh, I, uh, except I have about 100 of these cards. And uh, I want you all to take one, because my brother, my incredibly talented brother, made this for me. I sent him Andrew Cortez's card. And I said, can you make me something like this that looks really cool? And he did this out of whole cloth in like four hours. And he sent it to me. And I so proudly remember when I first gave it to the clerk at the senator's office on the hill. And as I was walking out the door, he said, what's your name? And I realized he never put my name on it. So <laughs> anyway, all right, that's it. Any questions? We have time for a few questions. I think, I think from the beginning, I've always tried to build a composition first. And I would, I keep, I still have scraps of papers and notebooks where I would go and I'd say, that shadow hits that spot at 11, 12 a.m. in September. And then I would make these rounds. I, I wish I had some examples of it I could show you, from, especially from the early work. So I always, I collect compositions like color schemes, and then I wait for the news or the moment to happen within. Are we okay on time, Melissa? Yeah, we're good. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, well, I guess I could have shown 500 pictures then. No, never listen to Zach. I'm kidding. Okay, so, so, but that's the whole thing. I, if, and, uh, and so I, I keep, I'll make my rounds. I used to do it in Florida. I'd just drive to the same spots and build a composition. And so that works. You remember, the very little we do is spot news. You know, we, we have to be good portrait photographers. Good, essentially, you've got the most essential thing is to be a good storyteller, of course. And so, and a story can be told in a, a single picture, a 12 picture layout, smoke filled rooms despite what the, what the photo department thought, or, and, uh, or, or in a video. So, uh, and so you build stories you know, slowly at first. You, know, you follow a script, you learn the rules of storytelling, you follow a script, and then you start breaking those rules and changing the script and building in surprises. And then I try to do that every single time I go out there. But most essentially, I don't allow myself to be led to a picture by anybody, any politician, any campaigner. Again, idle hands are the workshop of the devil. I'll work with you. My job is to ask you for access and ask you for, allow me to convey the truth. If you don't want to 
and your job is to say yes or no, and a no is just as good as a yes as far as I'm concerned. But still, at the end, when you look at my work, and I put up a bunch of funny stuff here because I knew I was following Mike Kepka. So, uh, but is you know, I'm very serious about the work I do, and 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 remaining balanced in that. So, yeah. Anyway, does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Is there a teenager? Yeah. No, I'm not a teenager. I'm sorry. Uh, so you're photographing powerful people. Uh, I think that in a traditional sense, the role of journalists is to speak truth to power. Um, as a in in your role, how do you how do you see yourself doing that? Do you see yourself doing that? Do you view that as a responsibility? And if so, how do you go about doing that? Well, I mean, it's absolutely my responsibility, truth to power. And again, it's like I say, I mean, you'll walk into a rally and there's like a, a hundred people here and then there's this dog leg, you know, where they've, and they create these, these faux crowd shots and then they try to hustle you over to a position. They've got it all worked out. They want that in the background. They want this and all of a sudden the little girl who breaks away and embraces Hillary Clinton. You just have to be honest with yourself and your editors absolutely have to have confidence that you're that they can run the pictures you're sending them uh, without you know being questioned on the veracity of it. So um, and again, I, and I try to build stories all, it's, that's what Smoke Filled Rooms was about. And when I went to the conventions, I did it again, embedding uh, you know, design and, and captions and that. Because sometimes you just can't tell in one picture, obviously. And, you know, it, it's, there used to be this, this odd little man that would stand in front of the Supreme Court with a rubber fetus in a jar. And he, was, he wore a suit that was 12 times too large and he had this very peculiar accent. And people would just roll into town and take a picture and he was the, the face of, and he wasn't, he was just, you have to, it's an easy shot, it's a dishonest shot, it's a dishonest part of the discussion. So you have to really ask yourself, am I being balanced, am I, you have another question? You're reaching for the mic? No. Okay. Okay. Anyway, don't get me started. Ask the interns. I always feel so bad at the end I have to pay for the interns' lunch. It's just not fair. Yeah. Um, you just spoke a little bit about this, but when you go into some of these kind of sterile situations, do you, are you only looking for what's interesting or do you sometimes I'm take sorry, am I only looking for what? Are you only looking for what's interesting or do you sometimes go and you take the safe stuff first and then you say, okay, now I can get creative? Uh, or are you just straight yeah. off the bat doing whatever you want? I mean, uh, last week, I'm sorry I don't have it here, I uh, was in China and there was the family photo. Every time you go to a G20 or a G7, they all come in in the family photo and, and they all stand there like this and they wave. The first shot is they all come in, they're looking at their name tags and you shoot that. But I knew going in that what that picture was probably going to look like. And of course, getting to the middle of the, sh it's difficult to getting your position in that. But anyway, I somehow managed to get a, a really top position. I, I was a one man pool from the US. And uh, I don't even know how I did it, a man my age, but I wrinkled my suit, but I did it. <laughs> but I knew the shot, all I cared about was how Putin and Obama would, with, would interact. And so there's the composition, and I just kept watching, 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 and, and, I, and the moment was is that you know, Putin, er, Erdogan from Turkey, during the whole photo op were like this. You know, obviously about Syria, and Obama, who's trying to get, at some point during that, uh, the G20, he wanted to, and he did eventually wind up talking to Putin, and he's just peeking over, looking at the two of them, you know, left out of this discussion, and the Times ran that pretty large, so, and that's, so that's what I'm saying, I'm looking for news, because we don't need to run that family picture. But, but like, for instance, with the Edwards picture and Carrie, so did you make those safe photographs of that first, the, and then you said, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a moment? Yeah. 
Okay. I mean, I was resentful. I mean, it's they're, when they're telling you, you the, there's the mansion, and they're telling you you can't shoot it, you know, photograph it, and you can't go. They're, again, they're, they don't want you to show how wealthy they are. They don't, you know, they're, this is the shot they want as them rolling down the hill. And I probably would have, you know, so listen, it's, uh, you, you, you roll, roll the clown out on stage and I'll, I'll photograph it. It's, and don't complain if you didn't like the way it came out. You know, so I'm not there to tell them how to set up their photo ops or I, I'm there to, you know, poke around and look for a little something. You know, a lot of that stuff just doesn't run. Can, can we talk about Donald Trump for a second? Yeah, go ahead. So you've been covering politics for a long time. Uh, what precedent, or how is, how is this election different? How do you see, how do you conceive of Donald Trump in having the experiences that you've had in politics for the last 30 years? Yeah. Well, I mean, I do try to remain agnostic about all this stuff. So, uh, and I ha I've been out with Trump a bit, again, uh, um, you know, we're all flawed, and every politician is flawed, and, uh, you know, some have fewer flaws, flaws than ever, and some have colorful flaws, and, um, but this is unlike, read smoke-filled rooms, this is really unlike anything we've, any of us have ever seen. I, I haven't, I've only been out with Trump, let's see, a few times. I've gone to some events. I spent a week out on the road in that California, North Dakota swing when all the demonst those demonstrations were happening. Um, again, I, I, I think, I truly do try, I hope that when people look at my work, they see balance and fairness. And uh, so I try to, I have strong opinions, ask my two brothers, but I hopefully I keep them to myself. myself. I think that's what we need to do as journalists, right? I mean, we're out there, we're truth, truth tellers. We need to, we, we should have opinions and we should you know, have strong feelings about things, but our job is to be as honest as we can, you know, especially in this, are we, are we all right? All right, does that answer your question? Was I evasive enough, hopefully? <laughs> that's from, okay. What precedent? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's well. You're always in a pen. That's a bit of a uh, that, that's been blown out of port. First of all, you're always in a pen. Secondly, it, it, there's very little access. But then there's always very little access. I mean, the truth of it is, I mean, I've behind the scenes, I've had very little access behind the scenes. How much do you want? The problem is, is that you make this deal with the devil and you start getting access and suddenly, you know, where's that picture of President Obama smoking or candidate Obama smoking? It never, it never happens. You know, you start looking the other way so you don't. So access is no better or worse really than what it is. It's the same thing. It's a person on stage. It's somebody wearing a funny hat in the crowd and, and, you, and you know, you have to, but when you're on those, when you're on a campaign, you have to look at the side door and who's walking in, you know, uh, in the back in the back alley. That might be your future Secretary of State or your future you know, Secretary of Transportation or whatever. They're building an administration too. So you know, that's smoke-filled rooms. There's very few pictures of the candidates. It's everything that was going on around it and and the emotion and hopefully and and that. So. It's okay. You just need the transportation there. Now, let me just say this, why it's important. It costs about $2,000 a day to cover a candidate. I mean, that's about when I do my expenses. It comes out to about that. And, but if we don't do it, my God, I mean, you really want them to just roll the circus into town and, and, uh, and they'll control everything. We, have, we are professional irritants and we have to remain that. We have to be there. We have to fight for the access. And if they don't give you access, that says as much as, as when they don't give you, when they do give you access. So, does that answer your question? Okay.